Make sure you stay back in your upper body. Yeah, no help. It's one thing again, misconception. We think, I'm supposed to use my seat, right? I hear that a lot. Well, I'm supposed to use my seat and do this and that. And what I always see when people tell me that, I always go, uh oh, I know what's going to happen. Because then they come out and they turn into giant little worms on the back of a horse. And they're wiggling and moving and doing all this. And what I always think is, that's not using your seat. That's basically white noise. That's turning on the radio to cover up something else, some other noise you don't like. It's just background noise. What it also creates a noise, I think, false positive. If I move around to create something, to do something, I can't feel what's happening underneath. So the more still I am, the more I can actually feel it. At the same time, if I'm willing, let's say, and she didn't move that much in the walk kind of, but you can see her just trying to help, going, oh, it's not quite there, let me help. And we want to be going, eh, I want him to have that burden. I want him to do it. That walk in is his, not hers to do. So I go, let him like a lever arm. He lifts it up, kind of throws it to get himself pulled up into canter. So that's what I want to be saying to her. You can have the arm a little low and wide again. Use a little bit of bend and take away his ability to use his neck incorrectly. We think again a lot of times misconception wise. Oh, I can't use my hand that strong because then I'm, I'm forcing his neck down. Or I'm making him do this or that. And yeah, in one way you kind of are. But you're not if you apply it right. If you're thinking, and that's what I want you thinking with him, you're not forcing him around. But I want you to make him not use his neck incorrectly. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm not saying you have to use your neck right. I'm just saying you're not allowed to use it like this. And I'll give you all these other options. Right? In his, this case, down, long, round, bend, this way, that way, but not up. I'm going to take away the up. And in doing that, I'm going to think like she's doing the low, wide hand, use a little bit of the bend, the bend. The bend is your best. I like that one, even though I picked up the wrong lead. And I like you made him keep going through it, right? In a funny way, I'm going to pick up this lead. I'd actually be going, you're on the right track. I don't want to pull him back right away and discourage him. That was good. I don't want to discourage him from using the one part of his body that I just changed from using that right. So like she did, I would just keep my leg on follow through, let him finish the transition. He changed leads instantly, great. If he didn't, I maybe would have cantered half a circle and then brought him back. And then said, I appreciate that you tried to keep your body in the right shape even though the outcome was wrong. Again, like a math teacher going, formula, right. You showed me your work, you used the formula right, but your answer was wrong. You still get credit for using the formula right. Follow through, good. You got it. Stay sitting still with it. Yeah, yeah. And then you think as he starts to get to that spot where he's a little bit round, exactly. Don't throw him away all at once, but just be thinking. I want that to arch out longer rounder. Yeah, good. One more. Walk. Using the bend, using the sideways, a little bit of leg heel. So as he got a little tense, as his neck started to lift up, the horses are not great problem solvers. They're not huge thinkers. They're very simple minded. So they will get themselves in trouble. You see that? But they don't always think their way through problems. So what ends up happening, and Emily's horse is a really good example of that. When, his, when he starts to get a little panicked, a little funny, a little weird, a little tense, he goes into panic mode. Not like panic, I'm out of here, I'm going to bolt out of the arena, run through the fence, but panic mode like something's wrong. When he goes into panic mode, the body instantly reverts. You do it, the horses do it. They revert to what they know in their muscle memory shape. We do what we say a lot of times, we call the fetal position, right? Where we all go, ah, like that when somebody goes to hit you, when you go unbalanced on a horse and you think you're going to fall off, when you trip, whatever it is, your body kind of finds that fetal position. Because you know, you know you've been trained to hold the trouble. So he says to himself, when a little bit of something sets in, ah, tighten your back and lift your neck. That's a pretty common horse defense mechanism. So he doesn't realize that the feeling he's creating in his body is half the problem that's making him panicky as well. So he presses his neck up, tightens his back. That feels terrible to him. And he looks at Emily and says, what are you doing to me? And Emily's going, why are you being so silly at getting that? getting yourself in that position. You can't say to the horses, oh, he'll figure it out. He's always so stupid, he'll get it. You know, like let them just, they don't figure it out. They get more and more and more in that panic state. 
because their body can't, their brain doesn't work that way. So like she did when he got a little bit amped up, she bent him, pushed him a little bit sideways and quietly said, I need control of your top line again. Because if I leave you, and it doesn't always mean their top line, in his case it is, but if I leave you to your own devices and your top line's getting that tight and that tense, it's gonna get your brain going in a negative way. Negative tension's gonna build. Your body's gonna get even tighter, so I have to break that cycle. I can't wait for you to do it, I have to break it. So that's where, like we were talking this morning, bend them. That low wide hand, bend them, and just say, oh, you can't get yourself into that negatively charged state. A lot of times, when they have the resistance, the way it has it, what he, the way he wants to press up, the way he wants to kind of give her that reaction, as the neck comes up and the back tightens, it's gonna seize up his legs. He's not gonna be able to go as forward as he needs. That's the wrong lead you're seeing now and then, that, and that up and down bouncing reaction we're getting from him. So what I want you doing and thinking is, every time he gives you that feeling, he's gonna back off, or lift up, or suck back in a way, go sideways and use the sideways to open up this pocket of bend to kind of push them into. So a lot of times versus if their neck is straight and you say, come on, go more forward, like you want, they just tighten more. That bended state, I said that earlier, is like putting your ear to your shoulder and trying to look up at the lights. It's not comfortable. So if we put them in that same bending state and then we drive, we're gonna be way more successful to get them to go forward in a sense and to break that tight stuck spot that he's in. Now a lot of times if we bend them and we confine them in front and we say, now go, panic sets in. Oh you have your hand closed, I don't like all that contact, now I'm gonna be even worse. So that's where I say go a little sideways, give him an out. So I'm just I'm gonna bend you right, I'm gonna touch this right rein, I'm gonna get your neck to fall down through the bed, there you go. Exactly right, good. I like this roundness there that you have to his neck. He's one we talked this morning about saying, we can't look at him and go, I'm gonna make his pole up and his nose out, perfect like a, a dressage book. Because if we think his pole's gonna come up, the moment his pole comes up, his neck gets about this long. So we have to be safe to him at this state. I don't want opposite either. I don't go, Emily, have to get his nose between his knees. That debate, deep, not deep, up, down, you know. I have to say that we need a long, correct, arching, reaching neck out of your shoulder, from your wither, that drapes over your shoulder, arching out into my hand, creating this arc of connection through the top line. So, what I, well, like I said earlier there in the counter, he just started to fall a little down, his back starts to lift, she just starts to put her leg on, and he's just starting to connect. But you can look at him from the ground to and go, oh, he's still behind the vertical. But he's still in that moment where he needs to be in terms of getting his body, his back, and the counter itself to cycle and work right over his top line. Once that's mesmerizing, and you just sit there and roll along, the same even amount of energy output that is just constantly there. Good. So with an Emily like there, you just keep countering a minute. I'm liking that. I like that with the low wide hand. We talked about that this morning about saying, with him with the pressing up he wants to do it, it's within bounds, it's totally legal to have her hands a little lower, wider, coaxing his neck to fall and encouraging it to become long, even better there. And those are those moments as he falls, you want to just close your leg and say, can I increase pressure into the hand so that I start to get him to understand